Oh, the joy. William Clark. Their baskets are formed of cedar bark and bear grass so closely interwoven with the fingers that they are watertight without the aid of gum or rosin. Some of these are highly ornamented with strands of bear grass which they dye of several colors and interweave in a great variety of figures. This serves them the double purpose of holding their water or wearing on their heads and are of different capacities from that of the smallest cup to five or six gallons. They are generally of a conic form or rather the segment of a cone of which the smaller end forms the base or bottom of the basket. These they make very expeditiously and dispose of for a mere trifle. Meriwether Lewis Chapter 1 Cape Dis Fort Stevens was built on the southern lip of the Columbia River during the Civil War to provide strong points near the Canadian border, to strengthen American claims against the British on the opposite side. It was shelled ineffectually by a Japanese submarine during World War II. But these days it attracts mostly hikers, bikers, and history enthusiasts who come to explore a paved, and unpaved, trail network that meanders past still buried bunkers and pillboxes and artillery emplacements built for a war that never came. The Peter Idale, a sailing bark that ran aground in 1906 still sits in the sand of the park and is probably one of the most photographed shipwrecks of all time. She is a relic tossed ashore after wrecking herself on the Columbia River Bar, the so-called graveyard of the Pacific, infamous for dooming thousands of ships to the watery tombs. The lack of a river delta has created a network of shoals here that produce enormous standing waves, Walls of water created when the full blast of the river current meets the permanent rage of the ocean waves. The bar is among the reasons the search for a northwest passage was so difficult, aside from the fact that it didn't exist, as ship after ship found it at the mouth of the river and thus failed to explore inland. Commerce was ultimately the driving factor behind all of Western exploration of the New World, but the Columbia Bar is where that force met its only match, the untamed power of nature. Nearby is a replica of Fort Clatsop, the place where Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery spent the winter of 1805-1806 among the Clatsop Indians before they made their return journey to St. Louis. Shortly before the bicentennial of the fort, the original replica accidentally burned to the ground. This gave archaeologists an opportunity to sift through the ashes for more corroborative proof that the replica had been built in the right spot. But in spite of this second chance they have been stymied. The climate of the area is such that all traces of the original fort seem to have been obliterated. It was last recognizable in the mid-19th century, around the time Fort Stevens was being built. Astoria, the second largest city in Oregon 100 years ago, was built on pilings on an island just inside a six-mile wide mouth of the river. Patrons visiting a downtown saloon could sip suds and then step outside to drop a fishing line through the holes in the boardwalk. A speed limit was enforced for vehicles pulled by draft animals, six miles per hour on city streets, four on roads built on pilings, when bicyclists came along, state law required them to stop, dismount, and wait for horse-drawn carriages to pass before returning to their bikes. One overwrought newspaper editor even proposed that cyclists be forced to remove their caps until the encounter was over. Every autumn the rolling swamp land near the jetty on the south side of the river, what the river has instead of the delta, 
is peppered with huddled human forms in hoodies sweatshirts. These are mostly teenagers and college kids seeking hallucinogenic mushrooms of the genera psilocybe, a group of species that very closely resemble the hypertoxic death caps and destroying angels that grow alongside them. Local paramedics and park rangers can recount stories of misadventure, of shroomers who don't know their shrooms and end up with their stomachs pumped or worse of psychedelic death hikes, even those who know what they are doing are often so paranoid that they shy away from vehicles, hide in bushes and so on, the dunes and swamps and tidal flats become points of fear and loathing, of potential doom, in dark clothing and with hoods pulled up they sometimes remind me of waves of immigrants from Mexico and points beyond creeping and stumbling in single files across the Arizona desert, with jugs of water rather than paper or plastic collecting bags. There is the same atmosphere of weird apprehension and the same lack of good cover in the landscape. Silhouettes on a beach For all the reasons to go to the beach, human behavior once there is disturbingly uniform, the sand and the sea act as social levelers of a sort, sand, especially to a photographer with a camera in his hands, is a universal nuisance, when wet it clings to all surfaces and is confoundingly skilled at invading the most hard to clean parts of a camera body or lens. When dry goes airborne in a stiff breeze to discover eyes, ears, exposed skin, and other sensitive places, but the real villain, or hero, depending on one's point of view, is the sneaker wave. These are relatively rare but statistically inevitable waves that can run considerably further up on a beach upon breaking than the average wave, average, that is, for a given beach and a given set of conditions, they occur all the time regardless of tide level, but are especially pernicious on flat beaches at low tide. They tend to result when two or more waves become stacked and there is no outgoing wave to slow their combined progress. While sand is a danger to camera equipment, sneaker waves are deadly. Panic ripples through a cluster of human forms scattering from an oncoming sneak or wave. Those nearest skitter away without thought, while those on safer ground turn to watch, to cheer, to mock. The little jump and instinctive flight of the about to be soaked, the shaking shoulders, involuntary giggling, and gestures of relief of those who make it or the chagrin of wet shoes and pant legs of those who don't, the whole transaction repeats itself with each new group of unsuspecting silhouettes. Especially fun to watch as silhouettes of the young urban hipsters who travel in tight packs of two or three elegant couples, dressed in solid metrosexual black and driving pricey solid black cars. After dinner but before hitting the bars to heckle the local bands, they stop at the beach for a sunset stroll. They move gracefully with all the good cheer of money and youth. They never seem to look at anyone but themselves. They throw their heads back when they laugh. From up the beach I see the end of their practiced austerity arriving in the form of a triple-decker sneak or wave. There is plenty of time to watch it unfold, but I am helpless to warn them over the roar of the crashing waves. They are lost in their social moment anyway, and oblivious to the whims of the Pacific even as it is precisely those whims that make the stroll romantic. When one of them finally sees the wave that will swamp them, their careful reserve evaporates like bubbles in the finest champagne. There are opportunities for chivalry, and opportunities lost, it's a free for all, the men are faster, they outrun the surge, 
until they stop to look back shamefaced at the dates they've left behind. Young women now not only fighting the heeled shoes they've stupidly worn to the beach, but the soggy skirts of their dresses as well. The two of them who escape with their clothes still dry, I notice, are the two, a man and woman, who never bothered to keep their cool, who never looked back, who grasped the reductive power of the sneaker wave that we all must run like ninnies or we will all surely be soaked like ninnies. My silhouette and my shadow are close cousins, on a south coast beach I stand with my back to the sea an hour before sunset as I wait for the sunlight to arrive more obliquely and provide an illumination that will probe the nooks and crannies on the eroded monolith in front of me. Low angles striking the enormous sea rock to reveal the rock's surface bumps and flaws. Today the sun throws my shadow at the base of the rock as usual but there is a second mysterious shadow, larger, deeper, and placed above the first on the side of the rock. Squinting back toward the sun to discover its source, I see a glaring patch of sand that is slow to drain of water. The direct sunlight is casting the lower shadow as expected, but the second shadow is caused by the light bouncing off the wet sand, lighting me up from below, creating on the rock two of me, deep in the dunes, on another day but at roughly the same time of day and season, a thick stand of beach grass draws my eye, as I line up my shot. My own shadow creeps into the bottom of the frame like a spy, the result is a sort of self-portrait of the photographer at work, which at such moments becomes virtually indistinguishable from play. Preteen Gangsters On the northern lip of the Columbia River as a dry and hilly extension of the Columbia Bar itself, that implacable threat to generations of vessels, lies a piece of land that I liken to a mini Yellowstone for the abundance of light, life, history, and geophysical beauty to be found within its scapes and swamps and coves and hollows. William Clark climbed to the top of this point of land and describes it like this in his journal. From this point I beheld the grandest and most pleasing prospects which my eyes ever surveyed, in my frown to boundless ocean, to the north and northeast the coast as far as my sight could be extended, the seas raging with immense wave and breaking with great force from the rocks of Cape Disappointment as far as I could see to the northwest, here the land is overtaking the sea and claiming more space for itself. On the scale of decades, sand is swallowing the sea battered rocks offshore and turning them into mountains by replacing the water with solid ground, new territory created by nothing but time, and the help of a nearby jetty, which is doing the grunt work. The English would have preferred that the US Canada border be set at the Columbia, which would have made the bridge at Astoria an international border crossing today. And rather than merely being in Washington state, Cape Disappointment and the significant history that took place there would now be commemorated in a Canadian provincial or national park. Cape Disappointment, as ironically named a place as I know, at least as seen from land on a summer day, is the point at which Lewis and Clark, explorers of a continent, finally ran out of continent to explore, a tiny border could similarly confoundingly named Waikiki Beach, a small sheltered cove near the Columbia's North Jetty, illustrates the story of Lewis and Clark's expedition from St. Louis with careful recognition of the Indian tribes encountered along the way, and ends, appropriately, in the sands of the beach. On the first sunny Saturday of spring I am exploring on foot, 
wearing shorts pulled from a near inaccessible corner under my bed and still reeking of winter's mothballs, a new safari style leather hat and sunglasses on my head, walking stick in hand, my camera slung around my neck, I grin goofily as I walk, I am aware that I'm grinning goofily and I do not care, after months of cold, Dark sulkiness and howling hurricane winds I have completed the first lengthy dry shod hike of the season, at last consummated the fantasy that kept me going, so I grin goofily and waft through this first sunny Saturday of spring like a long held sigh, I am following a road that will return me to my part of the campground, a relatively remote loop in which I am for the moment the only camper, the beaches parking lots, and hiking trails are feeling fast with families, but this road led nowhere particularly fun, it is not a road through the middle of nowhere, precisely, but one that wanders about through the landscape with no apparent purpose, perhaps one of nowhere's is service roads, the kind of road one follows to see where it will lead and for no other reason. I hear them around a bend in the road before I see them, when they come into view I see that they are not men, or are men only in the loosest possible sense, I count about six of them, boys of twelve or thirteen, not quite on the cusp of manhood, still firmly in late boyhood, they are the age at which boys travelling in tight packs, as they most frequently do, tend to look the most awkward, about half have endured the first growth spurt of adolescence, and about half haven't, even from a distance their clothes scream corporate logos at me, I can recognize the shapes of companies I've seen before, those of sports teams, soft drinks, shoe companies, and those I haven't, names and silk screened images of what I assume are rappers or comedians all of whom smirked or glared at the photographer who took the mugshot their parent companies chose to use to advertise them to the world. The boys are clad in attitudes dreamed up in boardrooms, but I can't criticize too much. It was the same when I was their age. Some of the logos haven't even changed. They carry themselves toward me down the road seemingly drunk on one such attitude an attitude they must have agreed upon prior to going for a walk so thoroughly does it penetrate their body language. They are defensively hunched forward, shoulders and arms tense and steps deliberate, as if expecting big trouble at any moment. Ready to fight, they scowl at everything they see so severely that one might suspect that they are secret agents, the menace of the suburbs. No good pretenders of doom, but for the somewhat girlish giggling I've just heard coming around the bend on this access road to nowhere, it is easy for me to diagnose, or so I suppose, they have just been discussing a new, or new to them, aspect of their culture, given the age and gender, I would guess it was something violent, misogynistic, or morbid, or all three and upon seeing my silhouette in the road have adopted a posture involuntarily and en masse of hardened criminals, or if not of criminals per se then at least of roughnecks who associate with them, I recognize it because I remember it, they are a group of friends from a junior high school hanging out together outside of school, at a certain age, these boys are right in the center of it, the only reliably universal connection many children have with one another is via pop culture, or more precisely, the common consumption of it. Now, free from the confines of school and parents, the temptation is to utterly indulge. I understand the urge, there is no way we will run into anyone we know here, so we can be anyone we want. I walk on with my head down turned to avoid squashing the various slugs, newts, frogs, salamanders, centipedes, woolly bears, and other things crawling underfoot, 
things that slither or ooze out of the ground to be squashed on first sunny Saturdays like this one. Ban un ar slug says ban un ar peels, or as Clark expresses it, snails without covers is common. I forget the boys are even there until they are upon me so silent they become, perhaps in the mistaken belief that silence is menacing. I look up and they are still scowling and awkwardly stiff at the shoulders as they advance, as if ready to push me off the side of the road if they have to. If the situation escalates to that, it is probably not the right time to tell them about the cute bunny I just saw. I look up, but I do so still grinning goofily, as helpless to change my attitude as they are. As I step aside to let them pass on this spacious road, one of the taller boys dares to make eye contact with me. In a flash the mask of mindless defiance clears from his face, and he smiles in return. Then the smile is gone, the boy's eyes dart down and to his right to see if his momentary lapse has been noticed. It hasn't. His shoulders rehunch and they pass by without comment, their united front of toughness still intact. So far as they know, we could be anyone. But in this passing moment the boy and I have managed to make a real, albeit fleeting, human connection. It is a genuine expression of strangers in nature, two people able for a nearly invisible moment to ignore age, race, and a tangle of cultural differences to communicate something recognizable above the din of calculated messages the logos scream. It's a lovely day. For a moment the beauty of the place trumps the crap and it triumphs over it, revealing the carefully focused grouped attitudes for what they are, nothing. There is danger approaching them, a cliff over which their hormones are about to hurl them, they will grow stupider before they grow smarter, and they will wallow for a year or two in a fetid swamp of machismo. Some boys will get stuck in fart place for much of their adult lives, emerging into maturity only slowly and only when the weight of maintaining such a front wears them out. But most will cross the line eventually, exchange old insecurities for new ones, and be quickly too overwhelmed with the work of survival and even personal growth to afford the macho charade they are imposing on one another today. There is no point in trying to explain to them that they will grow up, that a walk in a beautiful park on a beautiful day with close friends is the kind of thing that happens to adults only rarely and with much effort. For now they are all immune. Maybe they are right to strut, they are play acting, it is pure fantasy and they are twelve, I forgive them, still, I have to wonder about myself and my friends at that age, is that really how we looked? Adventure Sports A stiff northwest gale pushes a dozen kite surfers, surfers propelled by parachutes like power kites, south along the beach, they put in from the end of Manzanita's main street, riding the backwash of wind as it filters over the Niakane mountain, swirling them clockwise toward the sea, it would appear to be an impromptu, amphibious kite festival and a migratory one at that, they tack into the wind until two dozen feet from shore, where the beach forces them to turn at last and ride with it, the force of the turnabout threatens to rip the sails from their hands, but then they are never truly in control anyway, from this point until they decide to turn back, their nylon sails will make them play things of the winds and waves. Even from shore the event is exhilarating, a big comma in the sky, and a detached period below and a little to one side of center representing a human head, rides the flat spaces between the waves, a human figure taking on impossible speed before the run up. The moment the figure vaults over the tip of the wave, 
I swear I can see the legs bend in preparation for the jump, like an Olympic ski jumper, and the orbit, the moment of loss of gravity, and the seconds that pass while the figure is airborne and when the ocean is hushed enough to hear it, the delayed shriek of human delight, and the splashdown on the other side of the wave where once again the snap turn nearly disarms them. One of the figures that has been paralleling my walk south from Manzanita has evidently given up. He waddles toward Shory a little goofily, surf board tucked under one arm while his other arm flails in the air as it grips the long bar to which this still eager sail is attached. He motions me over to him with a wave of his wetsuit bound head. My harness came loose, he says, would you help me fix it? He guides me through a procedure involving lots of velcro, lungy cords, and metal clasps, shouting to me in the rough gale between gasps of air deep enough I can feel them. His arm wobbles like a wet, black noodle. His biceps are taut under his wetsuit and I imagine the exhaustion within. What's it like out there I ask? He has barely looked away from the sea since he beached himself. His sail, too, is trying to pull him back out. There's nothing like it, he says between gasps. It's as if it is the first time he's ever searched for a metaphor. He eventually just shakes his head. There is time for only one more comment before I finish the amateur repair work on his harness and he is bounding into the surf. To launch himself over a wave and kick his board into the air. A bit of flash presumably for my benefit. He is quickly a mere dot again, lost amid the rolling, crashing breakers, a mile or two from where I watch. The comment is this, this is the greatest adventure of my life. On a different day I watched two kiteless surfers riding a slow rolling river between its two jetties. They catch the waves and ride them upriver, inland before sliding to a graceful crash and floating back out to sea. Ducking the incoming breakers, they get some extra rest on the return trip by floating with the river's current instead of paddling, to catch a new wave at the mouth of the river, the waves, coming directly in at a 90 degree angle, maintain their shapes and momentum unusually well in the center making for very long if somewhat slow rides. It is an odd sight to see men standing upright on the surface of a river, weirder somehow than watching the same thing at sea. For one thing, there is a backdrop immediately behind them in the form of mountains and houses. From a photographer's perspective, the surface look like they simply shouldn't be there. Watching them has some weird chariot race feel to it. As if I were an emperor in a booth on the jetty and they are racing in an aquatic hippodrome for my amusement. Laps completed during Roman chariot races were marked by dolphin figurines on a metal rod near the finish line that were tipped forward to show the number remaining. Here, they could be real dolphins. One of the charioteers waves to me when he sees me snapping shots from the jetty. He makes two close passes on well-rounded waves as I fire off several shots, but they are a disappointment. The day is cloudy and while the jetty and distant mountains make for unexpected perspectives, the lumpy black rocks are visually uninspired, to say the least. The Oregon Beach Bill has its roots in a piece of legislation signed in 1913 by Governor Oswald West, for whom a North Coast State Park with a great surfing beach is named, and declaring all of the tide lands on the Oregon coast to be a public highway, because the beach was often the only feasible means of travel for people who lived there. The Coast Highway what would become 101 was completed in 1932, but the beach was still a backup route kept relevant by the mother road's frequent mudslides and washouts. 
In the summer of 1966 a developer in Cannon Beach built a fence around the beach adjacent to his hotel in order to create a private beach for his guests. By the following summer the beach bill was signed into law, and all property within 16 vertical feet of the high tide line was declared public property. The speed of the legislation is due partly to a television news director, who used a photograph that had been doctored to show the Oregon beachscape as it would look cluttered with fences, and the persuasive image swayed public opinion such that when the bill passed, it did so opposed by only three of 60 state representatives, along with the major effort by the Oregon Parks and Recreation Division in 1964 to create public access points at roughly every three miles along the 360 mile long shoreline. The beach bill makes the entire expanse of the immediate coast available to everyone, the free, the law is fair and wise, in a region eager for tourist dollars. A man in a wetsuit pulls a child behind him through the surf on a small but e-board, back and forth about 20 times at high speed, at a point when the action pauses for a few seconds, the child crawls off and begins walking up the beach to his mother without a word of thanks, the be-wetsuited man, Hold dangling sadly from the back of his neck, walks forlornly away after a stunned pause, pulling the board behind him, now emptied. I watch three people plant a flag in the beach, number nine, and make a circle around it in the sand. With sand wedges, they pick what seems an arbitrary point and play the enormous sand trap according to the laws of real golf marking balls, obeying the rules of honor. I watch one man waggle for about 60 seconds, never once allowing the head of the club to touch the sand, before topping his ball about 20 feet, rolling. I sympathize. When they are finished, they pick another arbitrary point and begin again to play hole number 9, a whole new way, whichever way they want. Disc golf is popular in the Pacific Northwest, too. If golf is a good walk spoiled, then disc golf is a nature hike gone horribly awry. The courses are just like real golf courses, but instead of greens and cups there is a basket waiting at the end of each hole, and the goal is to throw a frisbee-like disc into the basket under par. The sport is as absurd as it sounds, and that's a good thing. Anyone with a vacant field could build a disc golf course. Since the ground itself isn't much involved there is no need to maintain anything but the baskets, which are nothing but hoops on posts with loose chains dangling from them, which help to catch the disc if a shot is on target, like the crash net on an aircraft carrier. Another popular preoccupation is geocaching, that is, the caching of objects in various geographical locations. Participants follow GPS coordinates and other clues to locate widely scattered boxes in which the items are stored, and usually sign a book and add or remove an item in the box, to let others know they were there. There is no point, really. But the idea is that as long as you are in the area anyway, you may as well be looking for something. The boxes are often hidden in the crotches of tree limbs or between rocks or underneath trail bridges, hidden in plain sight like Easter eggs. Monkey Puzzle Tree On a soggy February morning I get a phone call from my sister to tell me her father has passed away. My brother called the night before to prepare me. Our father has been sick for several months. 10 or 15 minutes later a park ranger knocks on my trailer door. Someone has reserved my campsite for this evening, and I will have to move. 
This kind of thing happens sometimes if one travels full time. During the busy seasons it is often difficult to find sites that are available for more than a few nights, meaning that I must move over and over. I begin to ready my trailer for the short, sad trip. I won't be leaving the campground but moving a rig as large as mine any distance at all requires the same amount of unavoidable work, disconnecting cables and stuffing furniture and tarps and awnings into basement compartments, hitching and rehitching the trailer and deploying the screen room for the cats. Fighting with slide outs that have been broken since Tennessee and still require manual operation with a hand crank. The overhead of travel. I'm up to my ankles in winter's sloppiest slime. Utility hoses caked with mud, moss, and slugs. But I am oddly relieved to have some place else, any place else, to put my attention on a black morning. My father and I had it been especially close, some kind of rift had developed between us, although we had moved quickly past this in the final months of his life, the available time being short, I got to see him a last time, my one and only airplane trip during my years of travel, two weeks before he died, two weeks today. My father was a spectacular gardener all his life. He excavated koi ponds and nurtured ferns in cypress swamps, raised gazebos in beds of exotic flowers. He appreciated beauty, but he also had an active scientific curiosity befitting a surgeon. He collected and planted exotic species from around the world and concocted hybridization and grafting schemes, melding two apple varieties together, for instance, or grafting two entirely different species, or trimming yew shrubs to look like ducks. I think many of these experiments were performed merely to see how the plants would react. Mixed with these or consigned to a garden of their own were the vegetables. He weeded and fertilized religiously, sprayed for bugs, exulted over basketball-sized rutabagas. I don't think it was ever an issue of competition for him. In fact, I think the opposite. It was exactly the non-competitive nature of nature that appealed to my father that one must take what he finds sometimes, and, after countless setbacks, disasters and triumphs, droughts, floods, infestations and simple accidents, that nature always randomizes her bounties on whims. My father dabbled in photography, but had largely given it up by the time I was born. The proof is in the pictures. There are copious surviving images of my older siblings as young children, but the number dwindles down to a relative few of me, the youngest. At the same time, though, the number of stained glass works, oil paintings, and aquaria grew, my father didn't lose his creative impulses, he just transferred them away from photography. As a doctor he was often invited to attend medical conferences as a speaker or as an attendee, the ones he attended, if charted on a map, would be uncannily close to many world famous gardens, those of an oriental style built in Europe or the Americas being his favorite. His greatest passion in life was the work he did in Haiti as a medical missionary. He began traveling to Haiti in the groovy 70s as a young general surgeon, and he often took the rest of us along. Over the years he returned again and again before at last committing to the directorship of a clinic in the coastal countryside. In a few months the hospital will be renamed in his honor. It was not the beginning of an obsession but an early sign of an obsession already entrenched and bound only to grow more so. I think he always intended to be a medical missionary, a bug that burrowed under his skin during his experience in Japan, 
on the back lines of the Vietnam War, and hatched its eggs in Bangladesh, where I spent the first two years of my life, and he had been looking for a home, a proper place to put his lifelong passion, in Haiti he found it. The mountains loomed to one side and the ocean to the other, but otherwise Haiti and Oregon aren't much alike, sugarcane and papaya replace gorse, dry washes and bald hills replace pocket gorges and gushing, misty mountain falls, I try to catch some of the clouds in a glass jar to take home with me when our father takes us into the high mountains one day, Wending us through vertiginous passes to a lush haven atop the coast range of Haiti, completely above the cloud where there are still enough trees to constitute a forest in a nation deeply deficient of them. At a distillery, I am given a small paper cup with a gut warming swallow of banana flavored rum, my first ever taste of alcohol. From a patio behind the distillery my father distributes all the coins in his pocket to his four children. We throw them down a 100 foot chasm to impoverished Haitian children who scurry after each, dodging between trees and crawling on their bellies like lizards. My father enjoys watching them, to see which get to the coins the quickest. It seems somehow cruel to me. Why my father asks, I'm giving them everything I have with me, why shouldn't I have fun doing it? I don't have an answer, of course, but the rum that warmed my stomach in the cool air is now turning it. We eat dinner at a nice restaurant in the mountains, in a romantic courtyard alive with the tinkling of fountains and waterfalls, some real and some fake. The atmosphere has cleared and phantasms of stars, cut by the startling paleness of the Milky Way, are just visible through the candlelight. An enormous iguana prowls between the palms and ferns, and parrots and cockatiels and other birds of paradise chatter from perches. It is a place to which I will return in my memory in years to come when I want to remember a place soothing and warm. When I'm down, a dark, twisty shadow mesmerizes me, I can't look away, it looks like an articulated robotic version of a tree, I circle it a few times and it is utterly unique from each angle, a small scorpion clings to the trunk, Dad, what kind of tree is this I ask him, he looks up from a dinner of banana fritters and rice and beans with goat meat. He has already identified several other plants for me, a member of the cabbage family with gong-sized leaves as full of holes as Swiss cheese, a subtropical sundew that eats insects, but I hope that I've stumped him with this otherworldly thing in front of me, a spindly but immovable alien species that reaches out for me in the dark, that tree is from South America, my father says. It's called a monkey puzzle tree. A hit on an octopus. I nod and smile at a teenager girl and her parents as they pass me on a postcard perfect summer evening at the beach, in the bonus house of daylight. I walk on for a few hundred feet before glancing back a few times before stopping completely and pivoting on the spot to watch them, they are approaching a scene I've just left, a tableau involving a dozen agitated seagulls and crows, much disorder, and lots of incessant squawking, as she approaches, the girl runs ahead of her parents and slips gracefully into a bird-like trap, a bounding, skipping rendition of a seagull in flight. Her outstretched arms flap in time with her steps. She calls as she nears them and the gulls and crows begin to scatter. The birds are drawn by the gory remains of an exceedingly deceased octopus. Far from the most comprehensible creature while alive and in the sea, 
An octopus dead and on land becomes an awkward puddle of miscellaneous innards, tentacles, and assorted octo stuff, and a spectacle usually reserved for nightmares after the crows and gulls have spent half a day pulling sinewy gloves free, feasting on what's left, helping it decompose, watching the girls carefree approach from my point up the beach, then is like watching a prophecy unfold, as the birds clear away, still bothered and fuming, from her loopy bird dance the girl unleashes a very girlish scream and halts in her tracks, legs going rigid with surprise and horror ten feet from the corpse, she covers her mouth with her hands, what is it, her mother asks her, it's an octopus she yells back, a hey, what, an octopus, I keep walking. A few moments later I look back one last time, to see the acts of consolation and the explanations about the cycles of life in the sea and the inherent cruelty of nature. Instead, the father holds a camera to his eye, shooting down at the scene while his daughter leans into the shot from above, mugging toward the camera flashing gang signs and smirking as if she were responsible, as if she had made a hit, I will never see the resulting image, but I have seen the moment itself, which is a very different thing, the photo can lie, but the moment happens as it happens and is gone, and here is how it played out in front of me in silhouette, in the evening hours at the edge of the wine dark sea.